But when I look back, and I mentioned, you know, I started this more than 20 years ago, and um, I was in England at the time at the University of Southampton, and this came out in one of the local newspapers, which was supposed to show me today. I guess I'd aged, and so this is actually what I was supposed to look like today. Unfortunately, I did lose my hair, and uh, I can't do anything about that. But here it is, uh, you know, standing at the pearly gates of heaven saying, no, I don't want to come in, I'm just researching out of body experiences for Southampton generally. Which, if you remember, I told you I was fascinated by what happens to these people, you know, what's happened to their consciousness, and, and, and are they able to figure out what's going on during their cardiac arrest. So things have moved on a lot, as witnessed by all the discussions we've had today. And going back to our work, and you know, my questions at that time that I thought I would address in a year, which clearly did not happen, um, what I learned is the importance of pursuing something. So I, you know, we pursued something, we started pulling and like a detective, and you start to find things become more and more interesting. A lot of what you think maybe doesn't work out, but if you don't pursue it, you will never make any discoveries. So where are we today, for those who want to know? I described the results of the first AWARE study that challenged a lot of things that we didn't expect to happen. So we have now launched uh, AWARE number two. Um, and this is, again, a multi-center study that we aim to be carried out in 25 centers. We have roughly 20 sites right now working with us. It was developed over multiple phases, um, and it's continuing to progress as we speak. And I'm going to talk a bit about that. But the thing I also want to point out is that because of this work, it led me to questions such as, well, what's happening inside the brain if people have a cardiac arrest? It was very clear to me that this is completely neglected. No one looks into it. And we put together systems to measure oxygen levels, and there was a question that was asked earlier about that, because I was fascinated to understand what is happening to people's brains while we're doing CPR, while we're trying to get them back. And this has led to its own field of inquiry, looking at near-infrared spectroscopy, and multiple publications that have come out of that. In addition, we recognize the importance to sort of get some idea of whether enough oxygen is getting in the brain, and is that causing the brain to even start working again? Maybe these experiences that people are having have something to do with better quality resuscitation to the brain. And thankfully, that has led to um, uh, another area of work where we're looking at monitoring EEG or brain activity during cardiac arrest. So just to show you where we are now, this is the setup. You know, when we go to cardiac arrests at NYU and other centers that work with us, we put two monitors on the brain. One measures oxygen, one measures electricity. We're trying to see what the activity is going on inside the brain. We have an iPad that we take, which has an image and gives sounds, and we have Bluetooth headphones connected that we will give timed sounds to people while they're being resuscitated, and we can go back then and see how those may have related to what was happening to their cardiac arrest, what was happening to their brain in real time. Um, and this I pointed out, is just understanding that there's a drop in blood flow which causes changes to the brain, and it's important to monitor that. But how, is, how do these projects work? It's very challenging to study cardiac arrest. Here is what we are sort of showing in terms of our patients. This is not quite up to date, but it's reasonably up to date. It's a few months back. And you'll see that from our institutions that are working with us, we've started out with more than 4,500 cardiac arrests. But if you look here in terms of the overall number of people who are able to be recruited, and that's because there might not be staff available at nights and weekends to help us get the patients, we get to 465. Okay, but of those, uh, of the total number of people we've been trying to study, you only have 44 people who survive. Okay, so that's less than 10% of in-hospital cardiac arrests who've had more than five minutes of CPR. And the key thing here is just to illustrate how much more work we have to do to save people's lives. And also how difficult it then becomes to study. But nonetheless, we've incorporated, like I said, you know, EEG monitoring for the first time into cardiac arrest so we can see real time what's happening. And that's completely eye-opening. We've discovered that actually there are different patterns of brain activity going on throughout CPR with different EEG activities. Some of them, as we would expect, the majority of the time there is no brain electrical activity going on that we can measure. That's the MDA, which is a big part of that pie chart. But there are seizure-like sort of epilepsy-like activity also going on periods of time during cardiac arrest. And even maybe some patterns that might be not quite normal but closer to normal activity in the brain, which clearly shows that there's a lot of work to be done. And I want to point out that we've been observed this up to 60 minutes into CPR. So for people who think that once you've deprived the brain of oxygen, that the brain function is gone, it's important to show that you know actually 60 minutes into it, you can still get some kind of electrical activity. And that even if you can't restart the heart, it doesn't mean the brain is actually gone, which is usually how people think. They think the brain is gone after 5, 10, 20 minutes. And the question was asked about our work with brain oxygen monitoring. It's really a sensor we put on, as I said, you can measure how much oxygen is getting into the brain in real time. 
And we've been able to show, as you'll see from this figure here, that there seems to be a relationship with how much oxygen is getting in the brain, which also probably reflects how much oxygen is getting in the heart, and the ability to restart the heart and save people's lives. You'll see as you go along, the group that has no ROS, i.e. the heart never restarted, were unfortunately far more people, but their oxygen levels were also much lower than those who initially survived and those in the far right who survived and left the hospital uh, with an intact brain. This work is continuing. Uh, what else are we doing? Well, the challenge with cardiac arrest is that you know it's difficult, it's random, you don't know when it's going to happen. It's hard to get them to survive, unfortunately, despite our best efforts. But yet, you know, the question of what happens to your consciousness can be explored in other settings. There's another uh, particular circumstance that we're trying to study called deep hypothermic circulatory arrest. This is a procedure done predominantly now by cardiothoracic surgeons where they essentially will cool the brain down, not quite to the level that Sam Fisherman does, but to about 17, 18 degrees Celsius, which is about 68, 17 degrees Fahrenheit. And if they're trying to do surgery on the heart, they will stop the brain, and then they give themselves 30 minutes, 40 minutes sometimes to be able to go and, and fix the heart problem, uh, and then we warm the patient up and preserve the brain at that time. So we're trying to also develop pilot methods to see if we can measure consciousness like we're doing with the AWARE study, but in that particular model, which mimics cardiac arrest and death. Biologically, again, the heart is stopped. There's no uh, activity going on at that time, and we're trying to see what happens. When does consciousness disappear? When does it emerge out of that setting? And again, going back, I now realize that although I've spent the last maybe 15, 20 years trying to measure consciousness and what happens in the brain and understand all of that, but I'm now maybe because I'm getting older, maybe I'm getting closer to my own death, maybe because I realize I'm a man and I'm at the age where I'm likely to perhaps get a heart attack. Um, but I also realize it's important if I can study what people are saying. And so we've started a whole program where we're going back and trying to go through thousands of cases of people who've already survived to better understand what the experience was like. What we've come to realize is that what has been described so far as a so-called near-death experience is very inaccurate. It's just a tip of an iceberg. It has not been studied adequately. The research scales that are used are not appropriate and not precise enough, and it leads to a lot of controversy. So I'm going to talk a bit about that. Talking about the little child whose case I saw and other children who had near-death experiences, there have been no systematic studies of children. But they go to the intensive care unit, they go on ECMO, and they survive, and they seem to be reporting there are case reports, but no one's on a systematic study. So we're starting a new study that's looking at children who survived the intensive care unit to see what they've experienced and what it's like for them, and how does that relate to um, the adults. And in addition to that, uh, we're looking at, again, like I said, this transformative change. Why do people become better? Why do they have more purpose and meaning? What are the things that change in them long term after the cardiac arrest? And finally, can we study the modulators of all of this in the brain using so these are things that we're trying to do. I want to just ask you if I know it's late and probably everyone's quite tired, but just five minutes just to illustrate some of the challenges with understanding the experience of death. Okay. What happens when someone's had a cardiac arrest? Well, let's, let's really think about it. Someone's heart stops, they go into, as you heard, into an instantaneous coma. We try to revive them. If we're lucky, someone like Cherie will restart the heart and you get them back. They never come out of that coma. Their brain as was shown in the previous slide and talks, becomes inflamed and swollen, okay? It really becomes, it goes on fire. And so you expect the memory circuits to shut down. What then happens is to keep them in the intensive care, we give them drugs that sedate people, which also affect the memory circuits. And this can go on for days or weeks. And eventually the person comes out, and then we meet them and say, oh, tell me, for example, Sharik, what was your experience like? What would it, and then they're like, oh, I don't remember anything. And people say, oh, there's nothing that happens. But of course you're going to lose memory. But what would you expect? Or they come back and they describe all different kinds of things. right? So their memories uh, are either lost or fragmented, or multiple memories might collapse into one. For example, maybe three weeks into their ICU stay, the nurse was trying to prevent them from grabbing their breathing tube. And then they imagined that they were attacked by some demons later. Right? So you have to be able to distinguish all of these different things when you're studying these experiences. You can't just take everything that people are saying and, and just assume that it will happen at the same time. It's going to happen anyway. And then, of course, people interpret things. We all do based upon their own personal views, their biases, their opinions. And so you'll hear people describing the same thing in multiple different ways. For example, if they see a light, they might say, oh, that light was, you know, I saw a beam that was full of kind of, 
kindness and compassion, somebody else may say, I saw God, somebody else may say, I saw Jesus, somebody else says, I'm an atheist. I have no idea why I saw this, but I did see it, and this person was really kind and generous with me. So, but they're all describing this light. They're describing a being that they, they felt was full of kindness and compassion. And of course, the media takes up on this and adds a lot of stuff because they're trying to make things fit with old models. And one of the key things we're understanding here is that I don't think we should be looking at the past. We shouldn't try to make sure that these things fit in with what we may have been taught, whether from philosophy or theology, but also what is the future like? So just to illustrate to you, what are the key things that we're understanding? We're going through with one of our research associates um, a database of people who've had cardiac arrest and or critical illness and survived and their experiences. I also have, as I said, almost 500 cases that I collected more than 20 years ago, and there are other resources. But what we're seeing emerge is that when people go through this, they describe the following features. They have a perception of leaving their body, and we hear more, we'll hear more about that in the panel discussion uh, from Dr. Tom Afterheiden, who had a patient that he took care of. They then, for some reason, have this life review, which is very meaningful to them. They go back and they review everything they've done. Then they seem to feel like they're being pulled to some sort of destination, and then there's a decision made. Usually they say they don't want to come back, but they realize, for example, if you're a young mother, that you, know, you have a two-year-old who's going to take care of my child, and with that thinking, they find themselves back in pain, back in their body, and that's what they do. Now, just to illustrate, I said, you know, the so-called near-death experience, the you know, tunnel light, the light flashing by you, is a really, really oversimplified way of looking at what we're really describing. We've started looking at almost 42, 43 cases already, and in doing that more systematically, we've already found um, almost 40 or 50 separate themes. This is a qualitative study that we're doing in what people describe. I'm clearly not going to go through all of this, but just to say that there are multiple other themes along the lines of those broad categories uh, that reflect essentially an educational experience that people seem to have when they've gone through this. And we've just put them into a table for you, as I said, you know, this perception of separating, this perception of a journey, this perception of having had an educational experience, this perception of arriving at some sort of destination they often call home, and then this return that they have. So the question, of course, is, you know, we will never know what somebody's inner experience is like. It's impossible to either accept it or refute it. But the fact is that it occurs, um, and it's important for us to realize that our patients do have them, and they often feel afraid to talk about it because of being ridiculed. Um, there are different themes that they describe. Um, I have them here, but I don't want to go over too much on time right now. But just to say that for those who want to have a look at it, these are actually quotes from patients and what they've said. And we have many, many, many of these that I'm not obviously showing you, but just it's like it's sort of a, a gist of what, uh, what they describe. Yeah. You know, this is the person, your perception of separating the body. I turned around instinctively, instinctively and to my great surprise, I saw my body still lying on the bed with the eyes shut. I then understood that I was outside my body. This recall of information regarding what's happening to them. I could see and hear everything, but could not feel what they were doing to the body below. While watching the doctors and nurses working on the body below, I also remember being able to watch what was happening at the same time in the room they had taken my mom. In terms of the life review, I began a review of my life and the key moments of my life. We talked about that previously, and then, you know, People seem to feel that everything feels more realistic to them uh, compared to everything else that they've done. They also sort of see sometimes the consequences of their actions. If they've hurt people, they then see the downstream effects of the actions that they may have done. So again, um, I'll end with this slide. Shai was kind enough to show uh, our collaborators just to say that this is a huge effort among other institutions around the world. Clearly, we can't do this alone. Um, and I'm very grateful for everybody who's helped us. I'm grateful to all of the speakers today, and I'm grateful to all of you for being here to listen about what's happening in the field of cardiac arrest and resuscitation and explain what happens with that. Uh, the final thing I'll just say before I, I do really end, well, this is our team at NYU. We have new members whose pictures are not here, but we're sitting in the back. Um, anyone who's interested in more information, like I said, and this is really for the camera, for future reference, everything will be on our website. Please send anyone you want. Unfortunately, I'm not very good at social media. I don't have time for it either. And research doesn't happen in a day. So be patient, but information will be posted as soon as we have it, and I showed you some of our occupation. So thank you so much for everyone's time. I think we may have just maybe a few minutes, maybe five minutes just for questions. Um, um, before we end.